and thank you for joining me here at Why the Book Wins. My name is Laura and today I'm here to talk about Native Son, which is a novel by Richard Wright published in 1940 and I will be comparing it with three different movie adaptations. So there's the 1951 movie directed by Pierre Chanel, the 1986 movie directed by Gerald Friedman, and finally the 2019 adaptation directed by Rashid Johnson. And there is so much to get into with this episode because not only am I comparing it with three different movies, but just with the book itself, there is just so much to get into with this book. And so the first half of this video, I'm gonna be kind of doing like an analysis of sorts of this book. And then the second half is when I will get into the movies. So this is gonna be a book heavy episode, but I will be comparing it with the movies in the second half. And I want to warn you now, there will be spoilers for the book and the movies. And then also this is available as a podcast. So if you would rather listen to it, especially with these longer episode I, episodes, I know it's nice to be able to listen to it as a podcast rather than having to watch a video for it. So I will link to the podcast down below so you can listen to it that way if you want. But also if you watch it on YouTube, it is broken up into chapters down below. So if you wanna hop around, if you don't need a book analysis and you just wanna know how it compares with the movies, you can just hop over to those. Or, you know, my book analysis all be broken up into different topics. So if you're only interested in hearing about a certain aspect of the book, you can jump around as you please. And I'm going to start with a summary of the book. And there is so much more to this book than just the basic events that happen, obviously. So I will be getting into the themes and the message and the character analysis later on in this video. And if you already know the events of the book, once again, you can just get past the summary. And so we are in 1930s Chicago and we have a character. So this takes place in 1930s Chicago and we follow Bigger Thomas, who is a poor black 20 year old who lives with his mom and his two siblings. And he gets a job being a driver for a wealthy white family. And on his first day, he is told to take their daughter, Mary, to the university for her class in the evening. However, once he's in the car with Mary, she tells him, I'm not going to class, take me to the Communist Party headquarters and we can pick up my boyfriend Jan. Jan and Mary try to connect with Bigger and learn about him, but they do so in like a pretentious way. And it's still, they're trying to learn about him, but they're making it all about them, if that makes sense. And thinking that like, oh, we're such unique people because we actually want to get to know you and we want to know how you live and just treating him in this very condescending way. And they're wanting to eat dinner with him. But again, they're forcing it though. They're not giving him the option. They're saying like, eat dinner with us and thinking they're so unique for doing so. And they also want to eat specifically at a black restaurant, thinking again that just they're so different and they're so unique and making it all about them ultimately, even though they think they're being kind, which they are nicer maybe than your average person, but just being very pretentious about it all. And all three of them end up drinking during this night and then they end up dropping Jan off. And then when he brings Mary home, she is too drunk to make it up to her room. So he helps her up there. When he is in her room, helping her in bed, Mrs. Dalton walks in and she is blind and she's calling out to Mary because she can hear that someone is in there. And Bigger knows that if she knows he is in there with Mary, she will assume the worst and fire him. So he places a pillow over Mary's face to try to keep her from saying anything. And then when Miss Dalton leaves, which she smells the alcohol and so she assumes Mary has just passed out from drinking. And when Miss Dalton leaves, Bigger removes the pillow and he realizes that he has accidentally smothered Mary. He then ends up putting her body in the furnace to get rid of it. And then the next day they are trying to figure out where Mary has disappeared to and he is questioned by Mr. Dalton, the father, as well as the inspector, Mr. Britton. Bigger tries to put it on Jan, Mary's boyfriend, and that is very easy to do because Jan is a communist and of course people are very anti-communist and they assume the worst of communists. So it is very easy to pin it all on the boyfriend. And later that day, Bigger goes to see his girlfriend, Bessie, and Bessie inadvertently gives him the idea to ask for ransom money for Mary. So he writes a letter acting like Mary is still alive, asking for money so that she will be returned. And he signs it that it is from the Reds, the communists. And he tells Bessie about this. He doesn't tell her what happened to Mary, but he tells her about the ransom note and he wants her to help him get the money so that she is part of this. And she does not want to be part of this. She's just trying to, you know, live her life basically, but he is very manipulative and he kind of coerced her into this position. And so again, later that day, like in the afternoon, evening, he drops off the ransom note and then he shows up at the Dalton home and there are reporters there obviously because this is a very big deal. The Daltons are a very wealthy, well-known family and Jan has been arrested and so there's just all this drama going on and then the ransom note arrives and that causes more drama with the reporters and the news. And while all of this is happening, they realize the furnace needs to be cleaned out and so the reporters are helping clean out the ashes and when they are doing this, they find some bones and jewelry. And once that is discovered, Bigger knows that he's in for and he runs away. And so then he goes to meet up with Bessie and he tells her the whole thing is off and he tells her they need to go on the run together. Which honestly, I guess he wanted her to join him because 
I mean, she didn't really know much at this point though. She knew he had written the ransom note, but that's the only information she had. But nonetheless, he felt the need to bring her with him. So the two of them go hide in this old abandoned building. And then that very night, Bigger rapes and kills Bessie because he is worried that she will rat him out and that she will just be a burden on him. And then later the next day, you know, the black community is being ransacked by white people trying to find him. And so the whole community is affected by this. And they do end up finding him because they're going in through every single home looking for him. And so he is taken and put in jail. And then he is put on trial and Jan shows up and Jan tries to help Bigger and he gets him a lawyer. And despite Jan, and the lawyer's best efforts to truly help him, he does end up receiving the death penalty in the end for Mary's death. And so onto my thoughts on the book. So I knew very little about this book going into it and it definitely kept me on my toes and I wanted to know what would happen and it did not go in the direction I thought it would. Like almost everything that happens, I was surprised by. And while being a page turner, this was also just one of the most difficult books that I have read. And I was surprised too that Wright created such an unlikable character. I thought Bigger would be someone who the reader could easily sympathize with and side with, but he did not. Like by the end of the book, you can sympathize with him, but Wright did not make it easy. Like this character does a lot of bad things and the situation goes from bad to worse due to his actions. And then the way he treats Bessie. So yeah, he was very unlikable, <laughs> but I think that was the genius of Richard Wright to create a character so complex and yet by the end of the book, you have a better understanding for him and you can see where he's coming from and you can understand why he is the way he is. And the meaning of the book is that, you know, he is a product of his environment. So that's where native son comes from. And rather than him thinking that accidentally killing Mary is just this nightmare situation, he instead takes a weird pride in it, which again, as the story goes on, you can understand it, but it's, it definitely doesn't make for a likable character when they take pride in that. But getting back to just the writing itself, like, this book right, created such a stressful atmosphere. And as you are reading this, like you just feel that tightness and that anxiety and the fear and the anger that he is feeling throughout this entire book. And like I said, as the book goes on, like in the third section, you start to feel for him a bit more and especially the kindness that is shown to him through Jan and his lawyer. Like there are some really emotional moments there because Bigger has spent his life hating these people who hate him, but then he meets two people that actually treat him with kindness and try to understand him and just the effect that has on him was just so powerful. And right again, he just does such an amazing job at putting you in Bigger's shoes and you just feel feel all the emotions with this book so strongly. I will say it could get repetitive at times. And then especially the end when Mr. Max makes his speech as to why he should not receive the death penalty, even though he pled guilty, it does go on for quite a long time. And I did highlight a lot and there are some really profound things that are said, but again, it just went on for pages and pages and pages. And I feel like that maybe could have been condensed a tad. All in all though, I would definitely give this book five stars. It is a tough one to read again, partly because the character just makes some terrible choices and you have a hard time like understanding him and it's just so frustrating and difficult. But then it's also tough to read because of the racist world that he is living in and the things he reads in the papers and the things we overhear that are said are just beyond horrible, so upsetting. And I, there are parts where I would like start to read like one specific newspaper article was just so horrible and I started to read it, but I just, I couldn't even finish it because it was just, so terrible that things like that were ever said. But again, I would still recommend this book. I think I would recommend it to adults. I know teenagers read this in school, but honestly, I think it's only appropriate for like a senior AP English class, I think. Aside from that, like, I don't know, I feel like there's better books out there to read when you're a younger teenager in high school because yeah, this deals with just such heavy topics and it is a tough read unless the teacher is just doing a really good job at guiding the students through the book. But even so, there's some triggering topics in here and some really vivid, <laughs> vivid graphic scenes. And so I would recommend it to adults personally. I think a book, I think, that would be more appropriate that tells you, you know, the black experience in America would be If Beale Street Could Talk by James Baldwin. That book is incredible and it's just so beautiful too. He is such an amazing writer. But yeah, and it really puts you in the shoes again of, you know, the black experience in America. And it also, I mean, Native Son is good for a historical context because it's about segregation basically. But If Beale Street Could Talk talks more about you know, the systematic racism, you know, it's kind of things that apply more to today than the things in Native Son do. Anyway, nonetheless, I 
I still would recommend it. And I know me saying it's not appropriate for high school might be a controversial opinion <laughs> because I'm sure there's people who think it's important for high schoolers to read this book, but I just think there's better, less graphic options out there. But I wanna talk about Richard Wright for a bit. So he was born in the South and then at some point he moved to Chicago. And religion is a theme in this book because Bigger is against religion. He sees it as like a crutch that people use to just be content with the world they live in. And he doesn't wanna be content with this world. He wants to make a change. And Richard Wright definitely felt that same way. And he had family members that would try to push Christianity on him and he just really resisted it. And so that is definitely prevalent in a lot of his books. And this one is included in that. And then communism is a huge part of this book as well. Richard Wright himself was a communist, which you can tell when you read this book that he was. And in 1932 is when he began attending meetings of the John Reed Club, a Marxist party literary organization. And Wright himself established relationships and networked with party members. Wright formally met, joined the communist party in the John Reed Club in late 1933. And the book Native Son was an immediate bestseller. It sold 250,000 hardcover copies within three weeks of its publication by the Book of the Month Club on March 1st, 1940. It was one of the earliest successful attempts to explain the racial divide in America in terms of the social conditions imposed on African Americans by the dominant white society. It also made Wright the wealthiest black writer of his time and established him as a spokesperson for African American issues and the father of black American literature. As Irving Howe said in his 1963 essay, Black Boys and Native Sons, the day Native Son appeared, American culture was changed forever. No matter how much qualifying the book might later need, it made impossible a repetition of the old lies and brought out into the open, as no one ever had before, the hatred, fear, and violence that has crippled and may yet destroy our culture. And then this was also turned into a Broadway production in 1941, and it was directed by Orson Welles. It did only run, you know, for like the six to eight weeks, and then it didn't, but I still thought that was interesting. And so I want to talk about Mr. Dalton, because again, I was surprised how Bigger was unlikable, especially, you know, in the first two thirds of the book. But I was also surprised how the Daltons weren't like this these obvious villains, you know? And outwardly, they did seem like decent people. So we learned that he owns various properties, including the very building that Bigger himself lives in. And we also learn how like he is interested in helping the black community and he donates to the NAACP. And he also mentions how he like donates ping pong tables and stuff to the local youth center in that area. And so he's saying he wants to help, but then when he is asked why he doesn't rent out his nicer properties to black families, he says that he just assumed that they would rather live in the area that they're like designated to. And then when he's asked why he charges so much rent, he says like, well, that's, you know, just the way it is. And if I lowered my rent, it wouldn't be fair to my competitors. And so basically like the hypocrisy, because he was, he's saying he wants to help, but he's not actually willing to make the changes, the uncomfortable changes, get out of his comfort zone and actually do something that will help. And there is a great scene where he's talking about donating the ping pong tables. And I think it's Bigger's lawyer says something about how like, ping pong tables? Like, do you think that is what is going to make a change in this world by you donating ping pong tables to the youth center? Like we need bigger action to be taken than just that. And then moving on to bigger, which I don't know why I started with Mr. Dalton, but anyway, <laughs> moving on to bigger, the main character, of course, of this. So like I said, he is not likable. And as the book goes on, he just becomes less and less likable, especially with what he does to Bessie. But he's just a very feel for fearful person. And that fear causes him to bully his own friends. So he tries to make others look like a coward in order to hide his own cowardice. And he just feels powerless in this world he lives in. And we have a quote which reads, he liked to hear about how Japan was conquering China, of how Hitler was running the Jews to the ground, of how Mussolini was invading Spain. Spain. He was not concerned whether these acts were right or wrong. They simply appealed to him as possible avenues of escape. But then what ends up making him feel like he is powerful is when he accidentally kills Mary and, and he feels like it's something that he has finally done that matters and that has made an impact, which is true, but you know, it's obviously a terrible thing and he felt no remorse for it, even though he should have, but we'll get into that later. But there is a line I want to share that says, you know, when all of this is happening, he says, he was living truly and deeply, no matter what others might think, looking at him with their blind eyes, never had he had the chance to live out the consequences of his actions, never had his will been so free as in the night and day in fear of murder and flight. And then of course, you know, he keeps it to himself what he has done. And there's another quote that says, there was in him a kind of terrified pride and feeling and thinking that someday he would be able to publicly say that he had done it. It was as though he had an obscure but deep debt to, to, fill, to fulfill to himself in accepting the deed. And I did see a reviewer compare him to a sociopath because he lacks empathy and he takes pride in his violence and he wants to be feared. And he just doesn't show remorse for anybody at all, like let alone Mary, but he doesn't even show remorse for Bessie. And then he also resents his own family and 
when he's in jail and they visit him, you know, he doesn't care really how it makes them feel. He just wishes they wouldn't visit him because when they come by, it makes him feel guilty and he doesn't want to feel that guilt. And so he would just rather forget them and not think about what they're dealing with because he's just very self-centered. But then, like I said, there is an arc to this character and near the end, he starts to take the emotional responsibility for what this has done. And he's talking about his family and it reads, he had lived and acted on the assumption that he was alone. And now he saw that he had not been. What he had done made others suffer. No matter how much he would long for them to forget him, they would not be able to. His family was a part of him, not only in blood, but in spirit. And yeah, this third act, especially we do have some positive moments that happen between him and Jan and then him and Mr. Max, the lawyer, specifically a part where Mr. Max is asking Bigger these questions like what he had wanted to do with his life and what his dreams were and why he killed Mary and how her death made him feel, plus how he felt about Mary and Jan that first night when they were trying to get to know him. And Bigger is just greatly affected by these questions and he is finally to answer them because he had never even asked himself these things and never really faced it. And so this is just a huge moment for him. And before he dies, he wants to see Mr. Max one last time so he can let him know just what a big deal that was and the impact that that had on him. And it's just showing the importance of being treated like a normal human being, right? Like no one has ever asked him these questions before. No one has taken an interest in him or I should say no white people. And so when he meets someone who's actually interested in in him and cares and is asking him these questions about himself that he has never even asked himself. It's just this huge moment for him. And then again, when Mr. Max makes his speech on behalf of Bigger, we have a quote that reads, Bigger was not at that moment really bothered about whether Max's speech had saved his life or not. He was hugging the proud thought that Max had made the speech all for him to save his life. It was not the meaning of the speech that gave him pride, but the mere act of it. That in itself was something. And yeah, Richard Wright, it, he's an amazing writer because again, this character who was so unlikable, who was guilty. This isn't like To Kill a Mockingbird where the guy was innocent and being framed or something. Like he was guilty. He did this, he did bad things. And yet by the end of the book, you can see where he is coming from and why he did these things and what led him to feel this way and you feel sympathy for him. So that's amazing writing when a writer can make you feel that way for someone who was so unlikable for the first two thirds of the book. So moving on to Mary, as I said, when she is trying to get to know a bigger, she thinks she's being nice, but she's just, she's just very belittling though. And bigger just isn't able to accept her kindness either just because of the world he has been living in. And there is a great, great quote that talks about how like white people in general have, you know, cut black people off and put them off into this corner of the world. And there's this great quote that shows like why Bigger had such an issue with her asking questions about him and just going into how he has been treated by white society and then like the gall she has to turn and ask him how he lives. But anyway, the quote reads, in front of those whose hate for him was so unfathomably deep that after they had shunted him off into a corner of the city to rot and die, they could turn to him as Mary had that night in the car to say, I'd like to know how your people live. And so he just feels very ashamed and embarrassed and not wanting to be in that situation with them where they're trying to get to know him and trying to understand his culture or something. And then to talk about Bessie, because as horrible as it is what happens to Mary, what happens to Bessie was even worse and it, she was just treated so terribly. So Bigger forces her into these schemes, even though she doesn't want to, she's just wanting to stay out of it and just live her life. And she's just always tired and she relies on alcohol. So he talks about how his mom uses religion, but Bessie uses alcohol to just deal with this life rather than confronting it. But anyway, she just doesn't want any of this. And then he brings her into this and he makes her run away with him. And then he takes her to this old abandoned building and then he takes advantage of her and then he kills her and throws her body down like this elevator shaft. And when the police find her body, they use it in evidence in court against him for Mary's death. So they talk about Bessie, but they are just using her to incriminate him for Mary. Because again, showing how he's not on trial for what he did to Bessie. He's on trial for what he did to Mary because she is white. And so she is the one people want justice for. And in the 1980s movie, in the 2019 movie, they don't have him kill Bessie, which I thought was interesting. In some ways, I don't mind that they left that out because it was just... <sighs> So terrible what happens to her. And so I don't mind that they change that. But then it also just makes bigger not, it makes bigger more sympathetic, I guess, too, because that was like the worst crime that he did, I think, was what he does to Bessie. And so the fact that they left that out definitely changes the story. So I kind of have mixed feelings about the changes that the 80s movie and the 2019 movie did with that. But we will be getting more in detail on that later on. And I did want to talk about Jan, of course, because the only two likable white people are Jan and Mr. Max, who are both communists. And when Jan meets Bigger in jail, he tells 
was bigger. I was in jail grieving for Mary and then I thought of all the black men who've been killed. The black men who've had to grieve while, when their people were snatched from them in slavery and since slavery. I thought that if they could stand it, then I ought to. At first I thought old man Dalton was trying to frame me and I wanted to kill him. And then I heard that you'd done it and I wanted to kill you. And then I got to thinking, I saw if I killed, this thing would go on and on and never stop. I said, I'm going to help that guy if he lets me. And this was a great moment where Jan, you know, he's unlike Mr. Dalton, he's willing to get out of his comfort zone and he's willing to change his ways and he's willing to put himself in bigger shoes and see what it must be like for him to understand his actions rather than just condemning him without trying to understand him. And there's a great line that shows how this affects Bigger hearing Jan say these things and it reads, he saw Jan as though someone had performed an operation upon his eyes or as though someone had snatched a deforming mask from Jan's face. And then this is experienced again with Mr. Max and his kindness. And so, you know, Bigger has spent his life hating these people. And then when he finally ex has a positive interaction with them, he starts to see them in a whole new light because he had spent his life thinking they were just all the same, but they weren't. And then to talk specifically about segregation, because as I said, this is an anti-segregation novel and that was the point of it. And it shows what I thought was interesting is it shows how both sides, you know, black people didn't see white people as human beings necessarily and white people didn't see black people as human beings because that is why Bigger doesn't feel remorse for what he does to Mary is because he doesn't see her as an individual. He just sees her as part of this mass of white people, if that makes sense. And there's a line that says this saying, but Jan and Mary were not human beings to Bigger Thomas. Social custom had shoved him so far away from them that they were not real to him. And there is another really powerful moment where in the beginning of the book, before any of this happens, he is talking to his friend Gus and he asks Gus, where do the white people live? And Gus points to whatever neighborhood they live in and Bigger replies like, no, they live right down here in my stomach, he said. Gus looked at Bigger searchingly, then away as though ashamed. Yeah, I know what you mean, he whispered. Every time I think of him, I feel him, Bigger said. Yeah, and in your chest and throat too, Gus said. It's like fire and sometimes you can't hardly breathe. And so Bigger just really struggles with this separation and not being allowed to be part of that world. And he wants to be a pilot, but he's not allowed to be a pilot. And so just how he is being oppressed and he's kept separate. And so, like I said, Bessie uses alcohol. His mom uses religion as a way to deal with this. But there's a quote that says how, what his mother had was Bessie's whiskey and Bessie's whiskey was his mother's religion. He did not want to sit on a bench and sing or lie in a corner and sleep. It was when he read the newspapers or magazines, went to the movies or walked along the streets with crowds that he felt what he wanted, to merge himself with others and to be part of this world, to lose himself in it so he could find himself, to be allowed a chance to live like others, even though he was black. And so those passages just are so powerful. Seeing the world he is living in, you're able to sympathize with him and understand his actions so much more. And it kind of makes sense to some extent. And then I did want to talk about the very end of the book, which by the way, if you're watching this on YouTube, yes, I'm wearing a different outfit. I'm recording this part of the video a different day. Anyway, uh, so in the very end of the book, when he has been sentenced to death, he struggles with that because he feels like he never knew how to live. So he's like, how can I die when I felt like I wasn't even living? And so he has this final conversation with Mr. Max at the very end of the book. And Mr. Max talks about like why these people in high positions, why these white people in high positions like oppressing others. And it's because they are fearful of losing what they have. And he kind of goes on this communist, uh, you know, talks about different communist ideas to explain why that's wrong and what needs to be changed. But this conversation helps Bigger understand himself more and he comes to peace with himself and understands his actions a bit more. And then there's a part at the end where he tells Mr. Max, I didn't know I was really alive in this world until I felt things hard enough to kill for him. It's the truth, Mr. Max. I can say it now because I'm going to die. I know what I'm saying real good and I know how it sounds, but I'm all right. And honestly, like, I don't totally understand the point of like the very end of this book. I heard someone say that basically Bigger like converts to communism, so to speak. And that is what brings him peace and he's able to accept death. And I guess that's what the point is. And right, of course, like I said, he was a communist. So it makes sense that this book promotes those ideas. Uh, but yeah, the ending, like it felt powerful, but at the same time, I had a hard time understanding what the very end was trying to convey, I guess. So let me know down in the comments what you thought of like the final chapter of this book. And then to move on to the 1951 movie. So this book, like I said, was a huge success right away and it was turned into a play. And of course, because it was a huge success, Hollywood wanted to adapt it. But either the studios didn't read the didn't read the book, didn't watch the play, or if they did, they were just super dense and didn't understand the purpose of it because MGM offered Richard R. $25,000 for the film rights, but on the condition that it be an all white cast and Richard Wright, of course, turned this down. And then another film producer 
offered him a similar deal, but he said instead of having it be a black man, he wanted it to be like an oppressed white person, like a Polish person or an Italian person. And once again, Wright turned this down. And he, you know, wrote different screenplays and took it around to different studios, but he kept being rejected. And then after World War II, he moved to France and he met a director named Pierre Chanel. And so the two of them started collaborating on this and they tried to get the filming permits in order to make this film in France or in Italy, but neither country wanted to help produce this movie because they didn't want to ruin their relations with the USA. And so they didn't want to be involved in a movie that was, you know, critical of race relations in America. So ultimately Richard Wright and Pierre Chanel ended up moving to Argentina and that is where they were able to make the film. And so a lot of the voices are dubbed over because the actors had like thick Argentine accents, I guess. And so they had to be dubbed over later. Also the actor who played bigger in the play was supposed to play him in this movie. However, he had like issues coming to Argentina for some reason. And so he wasn't able to make it. And that is why Richard Wright ended up playing the role. And yeah, despite the fact that, you know, voices are dubbed over and the acting isn't always the best. Nonetheless, I was still impressed with this movie, honestly, and it definitely did stick with me. And it was interesting too, like because Wright was so involved in this, I would assume that the changes that were made from book to film, he was on board for, right? Like because he helped with the script and he played bigger. So it is interesting when that's the case, when the author is so personally involved, I feel like I can't be as critical of the movie if the author themselves are fine with the changes, you know? But I will say one change is just the fact that Richard Wright was 40 years old when he's playing a character who in the book was 20. So in the book, it worked better having him be a 20 year old because it just made more sense that he was this young guy trying to understand life. So seeing a 40 year old man be in that position definitely changed the vibe of the movie. But the movie follows the book very closely. So we have Bigger living with his family in this like ramshackle place. And all three movies begin the same as the book where there's this giant rat in their home and Bigger kills it. But yeah, he gets the job being a chauffeur. He meets Mary and Jan. He ends up killing Mary that very night. He writes a ransom note. He goes on the run with Bessie. He's arrested. We find out he killed Bessie and then he is sentenced to death. And overall, I did really like this adaptation. Like I said, there was this dream sequence we will get to that was unexpected and a little odd, but I really liked it. But I want to talk about Bessie in this movie because her character is very different here because in the book, the two of them were not in love. They you know, had this relationship, but you know, she was an alcoholic and he provided alcohol. And then in exchange, they would have sex basically was this relationship they had. Whereas in this movie, they are definitely like in love and wanting to get married. And she is not like as depressed as she was in the book either. And she doesn't work like in a white home. Instead, she is working at a restaurant and she was a waitress. But by the time the movie starts, we see she has upgraded and is now a singer at this restaurant. And there's a part where two of them go to the fair and they're just having this great time. And on a roller coaster and I think Bessie is the one or maybe it's bigger one of them says how like life is like a roller coaster sometimes you're up and sometimes you're down and that like was not how bigger was at all like his personality was that life is always down right and so his character was definitely very different you know his relationship with Bessie was more positive in the movie and then he himself was just more of a positive person at times in the movie and this is the only adaptation where he does kill Bessie however in the movie he kills her because he thinks she told on on him and that's why the police found him. However, when he's in jail, he finds out Bessie had nothing to do with the police finding out where he was. And so we do see him feel remorse for having killed her. Whereas in the book, he never seemed to feel bad about it. And he does have this dream too with Bessie, which before he kills her, he has this dream where he is like carrying this bundle and Bessie tells him where to take the bundle. And so then he's walking through these cotton fields and it leads him to a plantation he grew up on and he sees his dad and he like grabs his dad's hand and looks away. And then when he looks back, it's the inspector, Mr. Britton, who did not like Bigger at all. And then the inspector like takes the package, which is like Mary's head wrapped up. But yeah, it was pretty interesting. And there is a dream sequence in the book too. But if I recall, it had to do with Bigger's own head. But yeah, in general, he just didn't seem as tightly wound in this version, like I said. And even when he and Jan and Mary are in the car, like he's laughing and having a good time with them. So yeah, definitely a different vibe but the events themselves follow the book relatively close. And yeah, overall, I did enjoy this adaptation. I don't know if I would watch it again anytime soon, but I am glad to have seen it at least once. And then the 1986 movie, 
This one is the closest to the novel up until Mary's bones are found, but the actor who plays Bigger is 30, so we're getting a little closer to his real age in the book. In the beginning, we see him hanging out with his friends, and there's a part in book and the 86 movie where they're making these fake phone calls and just having fun, but then that playfulness ends when they get serious thinking just about what their life is like. And that was a great scene in the book, and it was a great scene in this 86 adaptation. And Oprah Winfrey is in this movie. She plays Bigger's mother. She doesn't have a huge role, but I thought she was great in what she was in, especially in the scene where she is begging Mrs. Dalton not to let her son die. So yeah, I thought she was good in this. And yeah, even though this one follows the book pretty closely, like for the first two thirds of it, it honestly was kind of the most forgettable of the three though, if I'm being honest. Part of that might be the film quality because this is only available on YouTube. It's not available on any other streaming platform. I don't even know. I'm sure it's been released on DVD, I would think. But anyway, so the quality was not very good and that can just take away from the movie experience sometimes. So that could partly be to blame for me just not liking it as much. But yeah, it was one of the closer adaptations. Like I said, for the first two thirds, it's very similar to the book. And we do have Bessie in this adaptation. And again, very similar to the book. And we see him go to see her and we see that she is dependent on alcohol and she's just very depressed. He writes the ransom note with her and he kind of gets her involved. However, once the bones are found and he goes on the run, he does not take Bessie with him and she's just not seen at all. And so the fact that they had her and were true to her character for that first part, but then just didn't have her be in it anymore. I was kind of confused why they had her at all. I mean, I get why they still included her, but she just, her character didn't really do anything. Like we saw him go to her apartment and he had the idea for the ransom note and then that was it. So like I said, I have mixed feelings. In some ways I'm glad they didn't have him kill her, but I still think they could have done something more with her character in this adaptation. But yeah, the ending is very similar. So the stuff with Bessie, I guess, is the biggest difference here. But aside from that, you know, the end of the book, the end of the movie does play out very similar to the book with the, you know, we see the mobs that are wanting him to be killed. And we see the KKK cross that is outside his window. And earlier that day, he had been given a cross by a black preacher. And so just seeing how in one situation, it represents love and forgiveness. And in another situation, it represents hate. But yeah, Jan comes to visit him. We have Mr. Max, we see the trial and the people on trial, and we see him receive the death penalty. And he does have a final conversation with Mr. Max, similar to the book. So aside from Bessie, I guess. This is a very faithful adaptation and I wish there was a better quality video out there, but I would still recommend it, but just be aware that YouTube doesn't have great video quality of it. And then moving on to the 2019 adaptation. So this one modernizes the story and I like that they have it take place in today's world. However, I feel like they didn't do the best job executing this idea. Like they kept the coal furnace and they have Mr. Dalton not have computers and not have cameras and he's like against technology, which doesn't seem realistic and doesn't make sense. And like the furnace, like who would <laughs> have a cool furnace in 2019? On one hand though, like I liked it because they did have some really cool shots of it. And so, I don't know. On one hand, I like that they paid homage to the book by keeping it. But if you're thinking about it, like logically, it doesn't make sense that he would have that. But this movie is beautifully shot and it, the acting I thought was incredible. I was very impressed and I was engaged in the story the whole time. I also really liked the score and it just really added to the atmosphere. And I do think it's a good movie to watch if you've seen the book because there are certain scenes, one in particular we will be getting to where if you've read the book, it's like a great scene. But if you haven't read the book, it might just kind of go over your and you won't understand the significance of it, which I guess you could say that about any adaptation that's, you know, adapted from a book. But, you know, you could watch this without having read the book, but they definitely have different things that are like a nod. And yeah, ultimately in the end, I didn't love this adaptation, even though there were things about it that I did love. So I had mixed feelings about it. But compared to the other two, I found this one to be the one that I was the most engaged in, I think, partly because it was the most different too. And so the, with the other two, I knew what was going to happen because because it was so similar to the book, whereas this one was so different that I was more engaged in it. And the cinematography was just incredible too in the acting. So anyway, let's get into the differences. So for starters, the character of Bigger is called Big and he like is nothing <laughs> like the character in the book. Like he is far more likable and he isn't the one trying to get his friends to rob a store. In fact, his friend is the one pressuring him to try to rob the store. So that was very different. And then he and Bessie again have a better relationship here in this movie than they had in the book. Although we do see him like checking out another girl at one point. And so you can kind of see that maybe he's not the best, but he is better than he was in the book. 
And then they have his character like punk rock. And so he has this punk rock look. And, you know, I thought it was cool. And I guess the movie was just trying to show how the character is, is not wanting to fit into the stereotype of what a white person expects him to be. But he also doesn't fit into the stereotype of what a black person expects him to be. And he even has one friend tell him that he's not like a real black person because he likes punk rock and because he didn't show up to rob the store. And so Big therefore beats him up for saying this, which you know, is understandable. Also, he wears glasses in this movie and that definitely se definitely seems very symbolic of like the events that happen when he is wearing the glasses versus when he's not. Because in the book, I didn't really talk about this, but being blind is like a big thing in the book. <laughs> I forget like the literary term to use for that. It's a big, it's like symbolism. Anyway, he talks about people being blind oftentimes in the book. And so in the movie, he has these glasses and when Mr. Dalton asks him about it, he's like, oh, are you nearsighted or farsighted? And Big says like, oh, I just need them because they help me see clearer. Certain things take place, like I said, when he does have them on versus when he's not. So I wouldn't mind watching this a second time and paying a closer attention to the glasses because they did seem very significant. But with Bessie, so in the end, when he is wanted for murder, he does go to see Bessie and he gets her to come with him and he says how they should run away together and like, they should get married. Like we've been talking about getting married, let's go do it. And like, Honestly, like this is not the time to be talking about marriage when you're in this situation. But anyway, she does go with him and they go into this abandoned building and she t asks him like, if you're innocent, cause she, he lied and told her he was innocent. And she's like, if you're innocent, then why are we running away? And he says how, you know, even though I am innocent, they're gonna assume it's me cause that's just the world we live in. And so we need to go on the run. And this was interesting because in the book, this isn't the case. Like when she has disappeared, Britain is like wanting to question bigger, but Mr. Dalton and is very adamant like oh he had nothing to do with it don't bother him like he's fine however one of the reasons mr dalton doesn't think he had anything to do with it is because he thinks he's too dumb to have had anything to do with it so it's still racist but in a different way but later in the 2019 movie so they're in this abandoned building and then he starts kissing her and trying to get something started up but she tells him no and that she gets up and kind of walks away from him and then he tries to strangle her but then he stops himself and he apologizes but at this point she's like done with it and like he had his gun or something and she tosses his gun out the window and then she leaves and she like runs away from him and so i think this one was my favorite depiction of bessie in some ways because it's not like the 86 movie where they had her but then nothing happens with her and so I like that you know she is part of his running away but then she doesn't have the fate that she had in the book or in the 56 movie and then with Mary so her death happens very early in the book you know it's after the first night when he takes her out whereas in the movie after their first night out Mary and Jen are drinking and then when they come inside Mary is like kind of drunk and she sees the stairs and she's like oh that's a lot of stairs meaning she wants help but then bigger replies like you'll be fine you got it and then they go their separate ways and that's it <laughs> so this scene if you've read the book you're just like wait what like that was the night that's when it was supposed to happen so i like that the movie did that to keep you on keep you on your toes and the book readers who think they know it's going to happen it doesn't happen that way at all but we do go from this where they go their part separate ways and then we go to a scene where bigger is like filling up the furnace so i thought that was a very cool homage to what happens in the book but yeah in this movie he spends a lot of time with mary and jan and they even go on double dates because he'll bring bessie with them and they just open up with each other and have more of a relationship mary does say like you know problematic things that are like kind of racist but not as blatantly so because this is taking place in 2019 right and again she's also like trying to fit him into a stereotype because there's at one point you know she's into her political things again in this movie and there's at one point where she turns to him and she's like you're outraged aren't you and he's just like uh sure <laughs> but near the end they go to a party and i don't know if bigger does i guess he does but they all do ecstasy and then jan and mary get in a fight and big breaks it up and then he brings her home he thinks she goes to bed but then when he's in his bed he hears her that she is outside like dancing out in the lawn and so he runs outside grabs her brings her up into the room and then she's like telling him how she loves him and he's like oh you're just super high like just be quiet and go to bed i don't want to lose my job and she was also running outside in her underwear so she's only in her underwear and he's in her room and then miss dalton walks in who again is blind and so this is when he covers her face and then he puts her in the furnace so it's very similar as far as that goes. But also I wanted to mention in this movie and in the 86 movie, 
after he accidentally kills her, he throws up. So again, humanizing him, right? Because I don't think that happened in the books. And then in this movie, it is Peggy who like finds the jewelry or the bones in the furnace, whereas in all of the other adaptations and in the book, it was the reporters. And so with the ending, like right after the jewelry is found or the bones or whatever, we just cut to a newspaper showing that he is wanted for murder. And from here, everything just feels very rushed. And we have a scene where we see he can't trust his friends because they like are wanting to turn him in. And then he sees Jan and Jan has like the same kind of speech that he had from the book, but it just didn't have the impact. And Big does end up pulling a gun on him, which just made no sense. <laughs> like he pulls a gun on him in the 86 movie and in the book, but it made more sense because he was still trying to prove he was innocent. But yeah, so he pulls a gun on him here, but it just doesn't fit. And then when Bessie leaves him, he is in that abandoned building and then the cops show up and he is shot and then he just dies right there. And so he is made out to be like a martyr and a symbol of like police killing innocent black men. But I feel like the it didn't come across well though, because Big was guilty. Like he did commit murder. And this isn't like the book where he he's guilty and yet we can see due to his environment why it happened. Like we didn't really get that in the 2019 movie. It feels like he just, he had committed this murder and he's guilty. And yes, he did it on accident, but it just felt very different than it did in the book. But we do see how when he commits the crime, he goes home and he has breakfast with his family and he's feeling great. And he has like lunch with his friends. And this is when he's wearing his glasses and he talks about how like he can finally see. And so... In those moments, maybe we do see that he maybe is a bit of a sociopath by not feeling the empathy he should be feeling, especially in this case, Mary is someone he spent so much time with. So I guess he's similar to the book bigger in that way. But like I said, the first two thirds of the movie, he's pretty likable and he doesn't come across like he is a sociopath or lacks empathy or something. And he seems, I mean, he has his discontentments with life, but it just wasn't as strong as it was in the book. And then Jan, who was a great character in the book, is just very bland in this movie. Like we hear that he has like uh, connections with radical political groups in Berkeley, but that's basically it. Which by the way, shout out to Berkeley. I used to live there. But anyway, so for the most part, I enjoyed this movie, but the last third of it just does not have the impact because it's just, like this is the bad side of them modernizing it. They modernized it in some ways, but not enough in others. Like they didn't make it apply as well as it could. So yeah, I kind of have mixed feelings about this one. I would still recommend it, but yeah, it just, there was something lacking, something missing there. And when it comes down to book first movies, ultimately the book wins <laughs> over all three of these adaptations. I would recommend the new one. Like I just said, the cinematography, the acting, but then if you want one that's closer to the book, the 1986 movie one is the most faithful aside from the Bessie storyline. But the 1951 one is an interesting to watch because it's an older film and just seeing how they did it, but then also seeing Richard Wright in the lead role was very interesting to watch as well. He's not like the best actor, but it was still cool to see him play the main character. But yeah, all in all, the book just really puts you in Bigger's shoes and you just feel it so much more and it's so much more impactful and so much more powerful. Whereas all of the movies, they just had something lacking, especially the 2019 one, which I know I keep returning to that, that one, but I feel like it had so much promise. There was just too much that just didn't add up. And so him being shot just didn't have the impact it was supposed to. I mean, he wasn't fighting the police and they just shot him for no reason. Anyway, I'd be curious to know what your thoughts are down below. By the way, I did watch a video. They have a podcast, I think, but I watched the video. It's of a YouTube channel called Black on Black Cinema, where it's these three guys that talk about different movies. And so I watched them talk about this one and that was very interesting and helpful to see their thoughts. And they said the same thing where like his death, it didn't feel like symbolic or like he was a martyr because he was guilty. So I would definitely recommend checking out what they had to say. And then also the YouTuber Life by Joe has a video. It's like a 15 minute video where she talks about the book and the 2019 film. And I thought she had a really great video I'd recommend. And she addresses the criticism the book has, especially James Baldwin actually criticized this book at one point. And so she addresses the criticism and why she disagrees with it. And then she also talks about the 2019 movie and how it left her feeling disappointed as well. But anyway, thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to subscribe, to like this video, to give my podcast a rating and review. And yeah, comment down below your thoughts on this book, on these movies. Let me know what you think about everything. <laughs> Thank you again, and I will see you next time. Bye.